Hello everyone and welcome to Cognitive Development in Middle Childhood. This video is going to take you on a whirlwind tour of some of the things I think are worth knowing, especially if you're working with grade school age children. Cognitive development, as we know, is going to address the ways in which these children are starting to think, the more sophisticated moves they're able to make mentally, um, the ways in which they're processing information differently, and strategies you can use if you are going to be a grade school teacher or a parent to help them learn more efficiently. So far, most of what a child has learned linguistically has come from a more competent communicator, usually a parent at home. And they are interacting with a small, tightly knit group of people. Once they enter school, however, they're interacting with more children all day long, hopefully diverse children. And so their vocabulary, their receptive vocabulary, words they can understand is growing at a crazy rate almost 12, uh, 10 words a day by the time they enter middle school. So it's pretty exciting in terms of language acquisition. What we know of children before they enter school is that they're starting to understand um, past and future. They're getting a sense of that. They still struggle with hypothetical f um, futures, but they're starting to get a sense of, of what happened yesterday, what's going to happen tomorrow. And their language is getting much more sophisticated. If you work in grade school, you'll notice that um, if you look at this example on the left, this child is has emerging literacy. They're naming very concrete objects that that they know of that make them happy. And then by um, as, but notice the progression um, in a few years um, of what children are able to do on the right side of the screen. Um, this child is trying to imagine what will have happen if Donald Trump is indeed the president as he is. You'll notice some flaws in reasoning, but what's interesting is you're seeing this child start to imagine a future, try to, try to um, decide how um, he or she is going to feel about that future. So this is pretty sophisticated stuff. Also, um, children are starting to move toward more abstract categories. Instead of talking about, for instance, um, you know, the chicken goes chick, 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 or whatever, um, and the dog barks, instead of just identifying what a thing does, children are starting to categorize, like, oh, dogs are pets, and not only that, but maybe they're good pets. That's a really big cognitive shift. It may not seem like a lot, but it's pretty big. As someone who works with young children, one of the things you could do is explicitly teach skills like inferring. Say you look at this word meaning paragraph right here, and you read the news story was the news story was based on a fabrication. Now the reporter will be in big trouble. If a child reads that and they're able to ask the question, well, why would the reporter be in trouble? They're already starting to infer, which is to say, they're guessing what's not in the page. They're guessing what the meaning of fabrication is based on context cues. And one of the things you need to do as a teacher is, is teach this explicitly. Like, what are the cute clues in here? How do you know? Rather than just expect them to do it. One of the big challenges in middle childhood is for low SES and children in particular, because typically they're hearing fewer words at home they may have parents who work odd hours. They may have access to fewer reading materials. And those children, because they will be hearing less language, remember that experiences build brain architecture. Because they may be hearing less at home, because they may be getting less interaction, they will need explicit instruction in vocabulary. Another thing children are doing is organizing words and sequences, hierarchies. They're also uh, learning wordplay. I actually remember as a child realizing that um, words had multiple meanings and those meanings could be funny depending on how you, you worded them. And if we look at middle childhood through Piaget's concrete operation stage, we'll notice that the patterns of development are that 
children are still pretty much focused on relating to concrete things in the world, things that they've learned that are seem stable in terms of their meaning and what they are. And so concrete objects are like the things in the orange box here, things you can touch. And so those kinds of things are easy for children to understand. What's more difficult are abstract terms, like the ones in the blue box. Abstract terms are things that if I ask everyone in this class to define, they might have a different definition. Abstract terms are slippery. They're difficult. You can't really grab on to something like deceit and hold it in your hands. And so these abstractions are still difficult um, for children in middle childhood in grade school. And so when they do describe their lives and they do project maybe what will happen in the future, they usually do it based on what they already know, what they've already experienced. Another thing is something we call pragmatics, the appropriate use of language to communicate. And we learned that we speak differently to our teachers than we do to our parents than we do to our siblings. Notice all of the things you do that are very sophisticated, but you have this automaticity. So you don't realize that you're, you're changing your register depending on who you're talking to. You may not realize that you have patterns for stories and jokes. Um, as soon as you hear Once Upon a Time, for instance, you're going to know that I'm about to tell you a fairy tale. Not only that, you're going to know how that ends, right? Usually with happily ever after, unless, of course, you go back to the Grimm's fairy tales in which they're very dark. But we start to recognize patterns in speech, in stories, and these change depending on culture. Another thing children are starting to notice is speech and language can be right or wrong, that there's certain patterns of speech, that there are errors, that there are ways we say things and ways we don't say things. And so this idea of proper grammar comes into play. When we think of proper grammar, we often think of um, sharp, polished prose, but what I want you to think about in terms of children in your class who are uh, not middle class white children, language can take a variety of forms. And part of that is really fun. And so what you want to avoid is trying to whitewash everybody in your classroom and have them all speak um, proper, let's call it um, newscaster sort of speech, the way that you can talk about this rather than incorrect or correct is formality. Talk about it perhaps as if, as, as if you wear certain things to certain places, like sometimes you wear a dress to church. Notice that's a concrete image, but you don't, wouldn't wear it necessarily to play soccer. So they, you're teaching children that you suit language to situations, but you don't shame them about the ways they speak at home and the registers that they're most comfortable in when they're wearing, wearing say, their pajamas. The comedians talk about code switching, and there I will leave you the links to these because a lot of times part of the tension that children feel is the tension between their home culture and their school culture. And some comedians have, have made great bits out of this. But you can tell that the, the humor actually comes from very uncomfortable situations. So I'll leave those for you in case you want to check out these comedians. Finally, in this section on cognitive development, one of the things that you can do as a teacher is have something called instructional conversation conversations, and this is right up Vygotsky's alley, that the way we learn is by verbalizing. And by verbalizing, we realize what we know and don't know. And so you want to keep kids talking. Um, you want them to be trying to find the words to say something. Um, you don't want to give them all of the answers. And I will leave you a link showing what an instructional conversation looks like. So this is part two of the video. I want to talk real briefly about information processing, how you can leverage it, and what we mean when we say intelligence. So what we know of children in grade school is they're getting better at distinguishing relevant and in irrelevant information. In one study, um, 
children um, were given two lines, uh, two lines of pictures. One was a house and one was a cage. And they were told to find the animal pairs. Now, there were no animals under the house. There were only animals under the cage. And little children just opened all the, all the doors anyway. But the older children, once they realized that there were no animals under the house, didn't bother opening the house um, doors anymore because they were becoming more strategic. One of the things that is most difficult to do as a teacher is to make sure children are paying attention. Because what we know of working memory is that if you don't have children's attention, it nothing ever gets into wor working memory. And so we're always, always asking children to pay attention. Now, when a child has perhaps ADHD, it's much harder for that child to pay attention. It's much harder for that child to focus. And so it's important for anyone who's going to work with children um, to understand what ADHD is and what it isn't. Now, there's been a big uptick in diagnoses of ADHD, which creates a debate about whether or not children actually have ADHD or whether our schools are, are really not um, student-centered um, enough. But what I'd like you to take a peek at, if you have time, and I'll put this um, link in, your, in our module, is this video um, called, Do I Have ADHD? Not only will it define what ADHD is, it will talk about two, two sides of this debate. One side in which um, health um, healthcare professionals believe that it's overdiagnosed, and the other side that believes that it's underdiagnosed. So I'll leave you to decide that. But we do have more boys than girls, up to three or four times more boys than girls who are diagnosed with it. And so it's worth looking at why that is. And this video will have some insights. I'll leave you to take a peek. So we have these parts of working memory, the phonological loop, which is basically that inner voice you hear. Sometimes as you read, you have this visual spatial sketch pad in which you can see things in space. You have sight of, of a mental map of the world. And then you have this cent central executive that kind of supervises this and decides what to pay attention to. A lot of times if you have struggling readers, they have trouble with that phonological loop. They're not hearing those words in their head. And so it's worth paying attention to what's going wrong if your students or children struggle with reading in particular. So our limited, our working memory is very limited. It basically we can only m remember about four things for 10 to 20 seconds if we don't do something with it. If we don't talk about it with someone, if we don't write it down, if we don't apply it to something. And so having conversations about concepts with your students is really important. Having them write down things, having them use tools to help them remember is hugely po uh, hugely important because we know if we don't rehearse information, we forget information. So this age, the mind is an active constructor of knowledge. The more concrete activities you can give um, children, if you want to try to talk about fractions, which by the way, is something they're not going to understand in the early gra grade school years. But if you want them to understand the parts of things, give them concrete objects. Let them touch and feel things. That's how these children learn. Okay, this is, I'm not going to spend too much time on metacognition, but I do want you to be aware that Children can be made aware of their own thinking, and this is really powerful. Even by age six to seven, they can focus it, um, attention selectively. And by eight and nine, they can recognize whether or not they're understanding s a as they read. This is really important because if they can pay attention to whether or not they're understanding, they know when they should back up when they should stop, when they should slow down. And so it's really worth having, having your student think about their thinking. Ask them, how do you know? So the last thing I want to finish up with today is 
the way we measure intelligence and whether or not it's fair. If you stop to think about yourself and you rated your intelligence on a scale of one to 10, what would you put and what would reasons would you give? Because intelligence is a funny thing and it's a slippery thing. So if you were to ask me, I would say that intelligence is the, your capacity to learn how much you have, it's the, it's the concrete knowledge you've already amassed, the things you know, but I think it's also the ability to adapt to new situations and the environment. Now, this is really important um, because the way you think about intelligence will influence your behavior and the way you work with children and the way in which you think about your own intelligence. So if you think of your of intelligence as an incremental thing, that you learn things a little bit at a time, that learning is a process, that intelligence is a process, you're much more um, likely to continue to learn and grow and, and, and be resilient about setbacks. Now, if you think of intelligence as being an entity, which is you either have or you don't, you're much more likely to give up easily. You're more likely to say things like, well, I don't know, I'm just not good at math. In that way, you're not thinking, oh, if I put more time and effort into my math, I bet I could learn it. I bet I could be intelligent at math. I could learn it little by little. Notice that that's empowering because you're always holding that door open. If I put in some more effort, if I think about it longer, if I practice, I can, I can be intelligent at math. As teachers, um, I beg you <laughs> to have an incremental view of intelligence, that it's something that grows little by little, that it's something you can foster. Otherwise, it's easier to give up on children. Now, one of the ways that we measure intelligence is an IQ test, and Alfred Binet actually wanted to develop this intelligence test as a way of protecting children's rights. Um, but what has happened is it's kind of turned into a way of labeling people and children. And so you can take this stuff too seriously, I want to say, that the standardized tests or IQ tests tell you very little. For instance, here, I'm going to give you a question that's a typical sort of IQ test question. And I'd love for you to pause the video and see if you actually get it right. So here's the question. Jack is looking at Anne, but Anne is looking at George. Jack is married, but George is not. Is a married person looking at an unmarried person? Your three choices are yes, no, and cannot be determined. Well, what do you think? Now, if I were teaching you how to reason through this, I might say you should draw this first because what happens, what statistically happens if you just get this um, problem as it's written here, especially if there's a cannot be determined, that you will default quickly to C because you're like, well, we don't know what Anne is and so clearly it can't be determined. But if I were teaching you how to take a test, I might draw this on the board, perhaps. So we got Jack, he's married, we got George, unmarried. We don't know what Anne is, right? What was your answer? Well, if we stop to break down the problem, we'd be like, well, let's play with if-then statements. If Anne is married and George is unmarried, then yeah, a married person is looking at an unmarried person, right? If she's unmarried, then Jack being married would be looking at Anne who is unmarried. So the answer is yes. And when we go back to this question, um, the research shows that when the letter C was removed, people got the answer right. But by putting the cannot be determined in there, people got lazy. And so the takeaway for this is not whether <laughs> a married person is looking at an unmarried person, it's how you teach children to reason through questions like this, how to make logical choices based on all the evidence. This is something that can be taught. And what we think about when we think about IQ tests is that you're either smart or you're not. Hopefully this demonstrates that you just give 
people strategies for working through questions like this. Okay. I'm not going to go into Howard Gardner's research too much because you've probably heard it before, but if you're not, um, you should just know that Howard Gardner decided that it wasn't that you were smart, it was how you were smart. And so he thought if we tease intelligence out, we're going to have a kinder curriculum. We're going to leverage um, the way students learn naturally to help them um, learn things that don't come as naturally. So, conclusions. Keep in mind that intelligence is a thing that is not set in stone, that it changes. In order for students to invest in school, they have to experience some academic success. They need to develop and maintain their cultural identity, and they need to develop a critical con um, consciousness so that they can question things. So teachers are able to control certain things. They can give emotional support. They control the emotional climate in their room. They can give quality feedback, precise feedback, and they can establish routines that help manage productivity and behavior. So as you think about your role with children this week, I'll be looking forward to your thoughts and posts.